welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And Liz, can I ask you a question? Mm, can you tell me about oh, that dress you got on, that yellow polka dot? Oh, yellow polka dot. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, uh, I have really not much to say about it, except that my <laughs> stylist, Pam, got me this dress because she always kind of had issues with the fact that I only wore leggings. Um, and she was like, <laughs> I don't know what story we're telling here, but we need to tell a different story. And so this was part of Pam's uh, story for me. Do you like it? I love Do you it. like can polka dot? Do you want to borrow it can later? I, Liz, can, yeah. I ask, can I ask you Why a question, not? Liz? Mm-hmm. Isn't it kind of sexist that Jamie asked you about your polka dot mm-hmm. dress, but not me about what I'm wearing? For Are you sure. really? For sure. They're I sure. don't like what you're wearing, and I love what she's wearing. That's true. why I yeah. asked her. I think true equality would be me wearing that hoodie that looks so comfortable that Jamie's wearing right now, and oh. you wearing a dress that's that's tight and that's a little. That's true. That's true equality. We I, gave you that hoodie no, though, because we don't have to. You did. You did. Equality doesn't mean sameness. I can wear something different, right? That's true. So we don't have to be equal for us to wear the same clothes. That's true. Idea is that we see each other as equal in our differences. Okay, as okay. long as women get pockets, pocket equality is the only. <laughs> and as long uh, as and as long as men can about. start wearing really comfortable stuff and yes. have as many <laughs> options and styles yes. as women. One hundred percent. See, everyone wins. We Everybody all win. wins. All right, so we got a guest coming on. Who's coming? Jason Wilson. And who is Jason Wilson? Uh, Jason Wilson. Uh, he's so many things. Mm. I want to just call him like a mentor. Mm. He is, which I think would be the ultimate compliment. He's got, he's, he's distinguished and established. He's a martial artist, but he's a mentor to thousands of kids in Detroit. And you might have seen his videos circulating around uh, social media where he was walking this young boy through his emotions and his feelings and giving him the space to cry and validating his tears. Mm-hmm. He's amazing. He's an, an incredible martial arts uh, instructor and also like a masculinity guru, um, mm. helping so many young boys become men. Yeah, oh, men. I love that. He is. Well, I'm excited to share this yeah, with everybody. A really beautiful episode. All right. Well, we'll be right back with Jason Wilson. This is Men. And our next partner has a product that I literally use every day. I do start my day every morning with Athletic Greens because I am lazy. Yes, I can remember which supplements I'm supposed to take, which ones are, you know, what what they mean, if I did take it, if I forgot to take it. So with Athletic Greens, I just wake up in the morning, I scoop an entire delicious green powder into a large glass of water. And then I've hydrated for the morning and I'm ready to go with all the vitamins that I need. And so what what's in this uh, green powder? Well, with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food, sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. And this blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all the things. And we know that with flu season coming up, all right, or I guess we're in it, um, (laughs) with holiday gatherings, you want your immune system to be fully ready to defend you so that you can just enjoy and be merry. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So all you need to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash man enough. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash man enough to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hello and welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. We have a very, very special guest today, somebody that I personally am really excited to talk to. I have been following his journey for years. I first heard about Jason Wilson when I saw this incredible video of him encouraging this young boy to let out his emotions. And uh, wow, there we go. It already makes me cry even thinking about it. Mm. Um, so Jason Wilson, welcome to the Man of Podcast. It's so good to see you and meet you, not officially yeah. in person. My brother. <laughs> it's, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. And I appreciate the work that you guys are doing. It's so neat. 
Oh, well, mm. speaking of your work, yeah. Liz, can we let our audience know if let's, they're not familiar with Jason? What let's he, what he go does? into all of the work. <laughs> um, so Jason Wilson, you have 22 years of experience in martial arts and 14 years experience training and developing young black men. You're the founder and the head instructor of the Cave of Adulam Transformational Training Academy. And you're the CEO of the nonprofit union, which has effectively trained more than 10,000 young adults mm -hmm. uh, in Detroit. You're also the author of of the memoir Cry Like a Man, where you share your own personal and powerful story of transformation, uh, your latest book, Battle Cry, Waging and Winning the War Within, uh, is a story about unlearning society's definition of masculinity and discovering your own power. Mm -hmm. Jason, thank you so much for taking the mm -hmm. time to be with us today. Again, it's an honor, and I look forward to our conversation, definitely. Mm -hmm. So sweet. Mm -hmm. Jason, we'd like to start off with a question. When was the last time that you didn't feel enough? Hmm. Uh, last week. What um, happened? Just uh, as a father, you know, if I could spend all day with my son, I would. If I could take him out of school, I would. Growing up without my father, man, it um, I have to be very careful because the father wound, when it starts to fester, it can create self-condemnation even when you're doing a great job. And so I've always said, man, I need to teach my son this. He doesn't know this. I'm not spending enough time here. Mm -hmm. You know, down to the second, did I, how many minutes did I spend with him a day? Only 20 minutes, that's not enough. And so just last week, you know, I always ask my son, I said, hey, if you could grade dad, you know, what areas in my life would you like for me to improve regarding our relationship? And he was just like, dad, nothing, you know, you're, you're doing everything that I need, you know, I need from you to do. And so that calmed me, but just that, Justin, just mm. always feeling like, man, am I giving him what I really longed for as a child? What I didn't get from my dad, can I make sure my son has that uh, mm. before he becomes a man? I love that. I'm not going to get through this episode, guys. Oh, why are you crying? What's what? What brings oh. you? What makes you emotional about that? Oh, so much. That's my biggest, um, that's, that's the biggest area where I don't feel enough. Oof. I was watching, um, I was just watching a bunch of your videos with your son and you posted a picture and you said, man, it goes by so fast. It was a picture of your four-year-old when he was doing he was doing karate with you. <laughs> and um, my son's three and a half. <sighs> so I got a lot of big emotions right now. But part of that, Jason, is because I think it's so rare to be in situations and around men who have done the work. So that's why Jamie's one of my best friends. And as men, we're never allowed to be in situations with other men where it's, we feel safe enough to cry. And I think knowing what I know about you, my body, an older man, a, a safe man, a man who does this work, a man who encourages his boys to cry, a man who's willing to go deep, there's a part of me intuitively in my body that goes, oh, it's safe. I'm allowed to feel. So one of my biggest struggles is my enoughness as a father right now. Um, so I'm crying cause I'm with you and I resonate with that. And, uh, this is clearly going to be an emotional podcast for me. <laughs> but how do men create that safety for each other? Right. What just happened right now mm. is like really, really beautiful. And if men had more opportunities to have that safety with each other, I think we'd live in a very different world. How do you build that safety with other men and encourage them to do it too? Well, you know, so often as men, we keep our sword sheathed. So when you, when I allow my sword to be seen and they can see the rust in some areas and the, where the friction hit the hardest, where the blade is dull, it opens other men up to say, Shh, this is what mine looks like. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of being courageously transparent. You get to the place where you don't mind, you don't care about the judgment you may face for expressing how you feel because you know inside that you suppressing 
what you're feeling could be very detrimental, not only to you, but those you love. And so when you clear this, that floor or in the cave of Adullam, you'll see, you know, recruits, even fathers cry. Cause we, we call it a moment on the mat. Because you have to think so many of us as men, we're like dams where the water is all the way to the top. Yeah. And finally, when they release it, it's just gushing. You start crying over watching a, a car race or something. You don't even know why you're crying because you have years of being emotionally impacted. And, you know, and so when men feel the safety to be human, yep. they say, I want to, I'm, I'm taking advantage of this. And that's what I do, Liz, is just give men the freedom to feel. You are listening to the Man Enough podcast. We will be right back. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Now, my life changed when I started the journey of healing, of seeking professional help. When I manned up, if you will and became man enough to recognize that I didn't know the answer, that I needed somebody else to look at my life and give me feedback. So whether that was getting insight on my trauma, going into my trauma, or just like getting some advice when I had anxiety or I was stressed out, therapy has been instrumental for me. And now, thanks to the safety and convenience of BetterHelp, it's even easier to get licensed professional counseling at a great cost. Now, this is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. Basically, BetterHelp has you fill out this questionnaire, and then they match you with your own licensed professional therapist that can help you with a range of needs from depression, stress, relationships, trauma, LGBTQ matters, grief, self-esteem, anger, and more, and everything you share is confidential. You can even message your counselor at any time with timely and thoughtful responses, but I do recommend to not use it like a crisis line or a lifeline. Boundaries are important. Now, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash man enough. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash man enough. Betterhelp.com slash man enough. All right. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. You know, just before we started the, the podcast, we had a little just quick meet and greet. And um, and looking at you, you know, you look like my father when I was uh, a boy. We're the same age now. We're both 51. right? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And when I see someone that looks like my dad, it stirs up some some feelings of love and joy. Right. Immediately. I'm like, I love mm-hmm. this brother. Um, mm-hmm. My dad is a. Uh, Come on, this ain't gonna be a crying session today. My dad is. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> my my father is uh, is uh, one of the best men to walk. He has shown mm-hmm. up for me my whole life, um, <clears throat> and um, and I know a lot of boys don't get that. And while my dad was present and loved me, he wasn't enough um, for me to um, navigate the world. Um, so it wasn't until I was, uh, about 25 years old that I went to this gathering called the black men's gathering. Now this was a group of about 150 men, um, that all happened to be Baha'is, um, that were meeting only men, no women, no other races specifically so that we wouldn't posture. And it was the first time that I was with men that looked like me, that I saw breakdown crying and sharing their full truth. And I didn't know what the hell to feel, know what the hell was going on, mm-hmm. because I was raised to fear, to fear me, to fear you, mm-hmm. except for my daddy. You know, mm-hmm. I was I feared mm-hmm. I would walk down the street. There was a white dude. I would walk on that side because if there's a black dude on the other side, I was taught not to not to trust him, mm-hmm. which was me. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> um, why am I sharing this? Um, so since that point, um, I did some deep diving. And when I see a man like you and do the work that you do and that you care about all humanity, but you know the way that you can serve humanity is also touching black boys, that you're touching people like me. So I appreciate you, man. I appreciate Mm -hmm. what you're doing for the world. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. That means a lot. You know, I didn't didn't have a father actively in my life. Um, You know, and so when I started growing up, I started resenting the only person who was really there, and that was my mother. Mm-hmm. And that's typically what sons of single mothers do, you know. Our, re- our hurt and our unresolved anger to why we're being rejected 
or the appearance of being rejected by the man that we came from, we don't know how to process what we're feeling. So we have to take it out on someone. So as a result, unfortunately, my mother um, took a lot of that. And if I would have just had a person like myself, if I would have had a cave of Adullam growing up, I wouldn't have almost lost my life three times. I wouldn't have practiced Hmm. uh, a a promiscuous lifestyle the way I did. I wouldn't have tried to sell drugs. I wouldn't have stole my stepfather's gun to try to impress gang members on my block, et cetera. I can go down the list. Um, And so the cave basically, it came about because I wanted to give boys what I longed for. Just a man who would encourage them without condemning them in the areas of their lives where they feel weak and then build them up to where they're strong and then send them out to live their own lives without him impressing his own, you know, uh, ideals on them. And so that's why it's imperative for me. Also, when I started the caveman, when I came, it was 2006 when I got the vision, boot camp programs was really popular. And they also had skills straight, straight programs where they would take kids and take them through the prison and try to get scare them from making these decisions that could end them up in prison. But I quickly discovered that you can't heal a child by re-traumatizing them. Mm -hmm. And then when I started looking at more, all these boot camp programs started failing. I said, well, wait a minute. Because at the time, guys, the Cave of Adullam was basically like a martial arts mentoring program where if the kids were getting in trouble, the principal would call me. But I quickly discovered that our boys didn't need more discipline. They needed more love. And so when I shifted the whole vision of the cave of Adullam, giving them a safe space and, and allowing them to re- really express what they were feeling in that moment, the results were undeniable. I mean, we had one group, I think the entire group of them, it was 16 boys who were in danger of not graduating. All of them graduated just after 24 weeks of working with them. Mm. And that all, without any academic tutoring, by the way. I just gave them an opportunity to release what was causing them to perform poorly academically. And so that's why it's imperative for me to reach boys who look like myself. Um, And then also to to shed light on the narrative that's being painted that, you know, black men are in their children's lives. You know, yes, you have some, I've seen some stats where they say, you know, uh, I think it's 78% of the homes are parented by single black females. But that stat can be misleading because mm-hmm. it's going off of them being married. That stat does not show that these fathers were still in these boys' lives. Mm-hmm. Like in the cave of Adullam, the majority of the boys have their fathers. But that doesn't mean there's not problems there. Like when I worked with some of uh, some white kids before, both you picture-perfect families, a lot of trauma. Yeah. And so when I started seeing that it wasn't just a black thing eventually, because like, like, hey, like you're saying, Jamie, I thought it was just us because of the trauma. We wear trauma like a badge of honor. Mm-hmm. In my community growing up, the hyper masculine black male was the gold standard. Mm-hmm. So here it is. I'm a very creative uh, boy. I could draw. I could paint. I like gardening, everything. I had to put all of that away mm-hmm. because I couldn't get a girl doing those things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so I became this image that I didn't even feel inside. Being a thug was really too small for a kid like me with a big heart. Mm. And then eventually, as I've gotten older, I realized what a thug was, and I made an acronym. A thug is a traumatized human unable to grieve. (laughs) And if you look at the majority of them, my friends who are dead, that are dead and gone today, or those that I know who who are in prison, they didn't have an opportunity like us to cry or to release what they were feeling. They'll go grab the gun. I even have some white kids I know who de- direct message me, who plead with me, Mr. Wilson, don't give up on us. Because majority of us who will grab an AK-47 and shoot randomly at people is because we don't know how to process what we're feeling. Mm. And so once I've, I started seeing the big picture, um, my whole viewpoint and mission really is to, it's, it's, I thought it was just us, Jamie, but it's men. Mm-hmm. And so if I could help break this cycle. narrative that we can't, it's a cycle that we can't cry. Even, uh, Justin, we talk about masculinity. There's nothing, nothing toxic about masculinity. 
A man becomes toxic when he only lives his life for masculine attributes, Amen. such as strength, boldness, aggression. When you only allow yourself to operate under that umbrella, now you shut off half of your, your, your humanity. You can't, you can't be a nurturer. You can't be compassionate. You can't be long suffering because it's, it's, it counters what this world has told us a man is. And as a result, we know the stats that uh, men die by suicide three to four times likely as women. And then another stat that was alarming to me, uh, nine out of 10 people who live to be over 100 are women. But you rarely see a man, I don't care what his ethnic background is, over 100 years of age. Because sadly, many of us, we identify our worth in our work. So we can't rest. We got to grind all the time. And even there's another word. If you look up the word grinding, it literally means to wear down, to crush, to oppress, to torment. And when you look at the majority of people who say they grind, they look worn out. They look mm. oppressed mm. because they look at rest as a sign of weakness. And so, I mean, I could go on You're and speaking on. Our man, but, um, yeah. Speaking our language. Speaking the yeah, language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for our podcast, we might just like start deferring people over to you. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, man. No, I, you, guys, uh, you guys are doing a great job, man. I, you are listening to the Man Enough podcast. We will be right back. Hey there. So I want to talk to you a little bit about planning, planning for the future, specifically a future that you are not here for. I can tell you as a parent, for me, it was really important to buy life insurance, even though I don't like to think about that. Just knowing my family's going to be taken care of just gives me peace of mind because no one knows what's going to happen in life. And if you're thinking about that at all, please consider getting life insurance, specifically Ladder. Ladder is 100% digital, no doctors, no needles, no paperwork when you apply for $3 million in coverage or less. That means if something happens to you, your family gets $3 million. You just need a few minutes and a phone or a laptop to apply. And Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out instantly if you're approved. And if you prefer, you can talk to a person. They have a team of licensed agents that don't work on commission, so they're not going to try to upsell you and have you spend more money. And there are no hidden fees, which means you can cancel at any time and get a full refund if you change your mind in 30 days or less. And ladder policies are issued by insurers with long proven histories of paying claims. They're rated A and A plus by AM Best. So you know if something happens to you, your family is going to get that money. And also, if you didn't already know this, something that I learned was that life insurance costs more as you age. Now is the time to cross it off your list. Don't wait. So go to ladderlife.com slash man enough to see if you're instantly approved. Again, that's L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash man enough. All right, welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. I'm wondering if you can help me with something that I feel like we haven't touched on in our podcast yet, but that I, I think goes beyond a conversation about emotional expression. It feels like there needs to be a next step of this conversation that's about emotional responsibility, right? That it's not just about have your feelings and throw them all over the place, right? Yeah. Or onto your partner or onto your friend or whatever it is, but also taking responsibility for the feelings that you have and then being mm -hmm. able to properly process them and channel them, right? You talked about this in an interview. You know, Rosa Parks was angry. She used her anger mm -hmm. in a productive way that changed the course of history and helped yeah. other people. She mm -hmm. used it in a way that was productive, not destructive. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can, like, speak a little bit more about that. First thing I want to touch on, the power of crying, the science behind it. Yeah. Um, I studied the work of biochemist uh, Dr. William Frey. William Frey, I was and about I to bring it up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, well, you, you already did. So, listen, I had an honor to really communicate with him, man, and... His work is phenomenal, but when I just when he discovered that tears not only contain ninety eight percent water, but also stress hormones that get excreted from our bodies when we mm. cry, and that's why the majority of times after we cry we feel better. Yeah. Mm. Now, to your point, Liz, about just the responsibility of so when you get a man from take him from being just a masculine male into being a comprehensive man, mm -hmm. he now has he this freedom now to express what he's feeling. Yeah. But there's a responsibility with this power mm. because not everyone can take what you take. Mm. And so I, I use myself for an example in Battle Cry, my book, I talk about the huddle principle. 
And so oftentimes, you know, I was first getting, you know, used to men being a comprehensive man, being able to express how I'm feeling instead of just only being a masculine male. My wife, Nicole, I would shatter her with some of the heavy things that I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn quickly what to share and what not to share and when to share, which which was most important. Mm -hmm. So the huddle principle is if I'm a star quarterback, and I come to the huddle and we're down by 20 points, but we still have another half to play. I can't come to the huddle and say, hey, guys, look, I'm tired. My knees hurt. I keep getting sacked. There's no way we're going to win this game anyway. No team has ever came back from a deficit this large in yeah. history. So, look, let's just go ahead and just go through the reps and get this done. And, uh, you know, we'll try it next year. Oof, let's go. <laughs> the, the entire team, yeah. the entire team would have been demoralized. And that's what happens to our wives. We have to be cautious or caring enough to not share heavy things on those who really depend on us for their strength at times. Mm -hmm. And you got to know the time. I have to learn to read the room. Ask my wife, how's she doing? How was your day today? If she says, fine. And she says, you don't look too well. What's Mm -hmm. what's going on with you? I said, well, I got something heavy. Can you, can Mm -hmm. you, are you open to share? Uh, Listen right now. So when she gives me permission to share that she's ready, mm-hmm. there's no better person to hear my pain or for me to cry and hug with than my wife. Mm-hmm. But it has to be at the right time. Yeah. It has to be at the right time. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks for sharing that. You you had said a little mm-hmm. earlier the science of crying. Um, and you know, it makes me think that my mother knew this when I was a boy. So when I was five, six, seven years old, my mom, when I would go to sleep, she would come in and, and ask me uh, how my day was at school or whatever it was while we we're going to sleep. She says, uh, anything happened today? Tell me about your day. Go on. She would say, uh, you got anything to cry about? I'd be like, no. Well, tell me more about your day. So then I would tell her about the playground and then this and this. Oh, how was Bobby? Oh, Bobby was cool. How was such and such, such and such? Well, what else happened there? Anything you that made you feel sad? Well, yeah, uh, Jimmy, he called me uh, a jigaboo and a monkey and a, she's like, how'd it make you feel? And I was like, uh, yeah, it made me sad. And then I start crying mm. and I would let it out. And she did this all the time. She'd come to my room and find the thing that happened throughout the day uh, so that I could release it and I could talk about it and gave me permission to cry. Mm. And so mm. many men, um, you know, if I think of the majority of my friends, women, I mean, I've probably experienced crying with all of them. Men, just a couple. And, mm. um, you know, it's interesting. Go ahead. I, go no, ahead. no, please you, go you're ahead. You're saying a lot of stuff that's hitting me, man. I mean, no. I, I, I wish my mother would have uh, given me that type of space, but she was wounded. I lost two brothers mm. to homicide. And so she loved me, but she was guarded. Of course. Uh, my, psychothera- my psychotherapist asked me one day um, because. <laughs> I, I still fight to this day to be um, romantic with my wife, like holding her hand and walking. We walk through the park or whatever, because growing up in my community, you know, they test you like, oh, you, you, oh, you that tough that you can walk with her holding her hand and you end up fighting because you were a girl. Mm-hmm. And my brothers would always tell me growing up, don't let a woman know that you really like her or she'll use it against you. So that carried over. It literally that carried over into my marriage but anyway that my psychotherapist said jason who uh, when you hurt yourself who will put a band-aid on you and i assessed it i'm like mm. i would i would go in a medicine cabinet and look for the peroxide and, and things and the band-aid and he, where was your mother and my mother never really tended to me that way because she loved me as we found i found out later in our life, but she was just so guarded. So it was very fortunate that you had a mother because typically, especially with single moms, because a man isn't there, they're trying to make their sons tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they'll tell you, don't cry, punch them next time that happens. Those, mm-hmm. you know, so that's what they're trying to do because they're scared. They don't mm-hmm. have the support, you know? And so that's a, a major blessing. And the, and the thing that many men need to realize, you may not shed tears, but you're crying. Mm-hmm. It's just coming out the wrong way. Mm-hmm. I share a story uh, in Battle Cry when I had a puppy. His name was Colby, and uh, he had gotten away from me. 
And as he was running down the sidewalk, one of the teenagers down the block was trying to like stomp on the leash to stomp him. But he accidentally stepped on Kobe crushing his ribs. And so I had to go carry my puppy who's like whimpering in pain, carrying this dog back to the house and not knowing what to do with him. My brother takes him to get him a put to sleep and I'm sitting in my room instead of crying because again, no one ever told me it was okay for a boy to cry. Mm. My father would, would talk about me if I shared a tear. I mean, you were even admonished for being a virgin, you know, and I, I think I was 12 at the time. And I share how that suppression led to me wanting to kill the teenager who stepped on my dog. Mm. And I said, what if I would have known at that time it was okay for me to cry? To release this grief, because when we don't release it, it's going to turn into something else. Yep. That's when we become toxic, because if we feel that we got to be strong all the time, which, by the way, it is impossible for any human to do. You can't be strong all the time. So now when you feel that you're weak, when you're feeling vulnerable, you feel that you're not a man. And so now you want to try to defend this manhood. Like, you know, they stomped my dog out. I, I ignored the fact that it was accidental or anything. I said, you know what? I'm going to try to kill him. <laughs> Thankfully, he moved. But that's what happens to our boys and men when, you know, when there is no other options to feel. Okay, cool. This is how we deal with this situation. Let's make it happen. We are programmed subconsciously. And unfortunately, it's, it's truly not what I call comprehensive manhood. And so when you become a comprehensive man, you're strong but sensitive. You're courageous but also compassionate. You boldly live from the good in your heart instead of your fears. So again, we know this world needs our masculinity. Mm. Like firemen, I, and I have several friends who are firemen, friends who are firemen. I mean, they have to jump into a certain mold when you have to run into a burning building to save a child. You need to be strong. You need to be courageous. You need to exude those masculine attributes. But what happened to my friends when they can't let go of the trauma, when they can't get the bars off the door and see a family literally melt before their eyes. Yeah. Okay. Masculine attributes won't help you then. You have to learn how to release, cry, get counseling and therapy to help you unlearn what you just saw. And so it's just so imperative that, man, we learn how to not only shed physical tears, but to release the trauma and the emotional pain that we've held in our heart and mind for years. Well, that's the work. That's the William Levy's work is that, there's the tears mm -hmm. that we cry when you watch a movie. You, that commercial comes on and that song, whatever it is, there's those tears. And then there are the tears that hold our stress hormones, right? Mm -hmm. And those tears that hold our stress hormones are the tears that we repress because those are vulnerable tears. That's why I tell my dad, makes us feel weak. There's a, there was a difference in my family. We were emotional, but we weren't vulnerable. Mm. The vulnerable tears are the tears mm. that hold all of the pain and the stress in our bodies. And those are the tears that we start repressing as boys at such a young age, mm. which has to be linked to our shorter life expectancies, which has to be linked to the fact that we kill ourselves at higher rates than women. So I just, I, I, I just love what you're doing and what you're saying. I want to know though, Jason, like what was the moment for you that like switched switch that light bulb on in your head and uh and where you realize like this way isn't working for me anymore and you educated yourself and you went and you went into your body and you cried those tears um when my mother uh developed dementia um the first two years i was you know doing what any loving son would do who's masculine minded i would provide, do everything that I could for to make sure she was supported and taken care of. I would protect her from pharmaceutical companies who would try to rip her off for medication or doctors who could care less about her and were just writing her prescriptions just to get her out of her office. But when it came time for me to be patient because she would ask me the same question 30 times in an hour or to be long suffering because she would curse me out when she thought, uh, I was someone from her past who had mm. abused her. Uh, when the caregiver, when she couldn't, when she was overwhelmed and one of her staff didn't come, I had to wash mom. I had to comb her hair. I had to massage her scalp. 
those were like, it was a major struggle for me. And I literally was about to have a nervous breakdown and my wife and I prayed. And after praying, Justin, when I started loving my mother, like I longed to as a child, because she was guarded, I was guarded. So Mm. we had a little invisible wall up. But when I started loving her from my heart, when I became a mama's boy again, because again, no boy wanted to be called that. But here it is, I'm 40 years old. I could do her nails. I didn't care who was watching. I would go buy bras for her in the mall and didn't care asking the right, I need this size. And then finding out Leah's how expensive they are. <laughs> I'm like, this can't be the price for one bra. Mm-hmm. But that's what transformed me into the man I am today. And because of that, I'm able to cry without reservation. I'm able to also be strong and dominant without fearing that I'm wrong for being such. I mean, I remember one time just my mother had got admitted to a rehab center after having her second stroke. Did you know their goal was to keep them there as long as they can to make money off of them as far as insurance? Of course. Yes. And I had to become, went from, again, this nurturer to something that was dominant and demanded that they release my mother that week. And my mother looked up at me and started smiling and says, I'm so proud of you. You got it. And so, Justin, that was the time in my life when I learned how to control my emotions. Because if anyone who's listening right now, they know if you have a parent on Alzheimer's that has Alzheimer's or dementia, I mean, it's up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. And if you're not emotionally stable, you're going to go up and down with them. And so I created a concept. In short, it was called the emotional roller coaster where I would let mom go up and down, up and down. But I would stay on the ground and watch her as she's going through this ride and wait for her to exit the ride and then gracefully gra- reach out to her, grab her hand and walk her to stable ground. And so I attribute that to transforming me. So, Jason, how does how does someone who's listening, uh, I'm going to say a man, mm-hmm. take what you're saying, which is we need to also learn how to control our emotions and yet at the same time relinquish control of our emotions, which is, I think, the confusing message we get today as men because there's an emphasis on the control part, right? To control everything in our lives is part of the patriarchy. We got to control, control, control. And part of the killing off of our emotions is to control. And yet what I just heard you say was that you became a comprehensive man by submission, by letting go of control, by releasing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And and so there's a little bit of uh, dichotomy there that I just want to unpack because if I'm just listening and I haven't done this work yet, I don't even know how to let go. I don't even know how to mm-hmm. cry, right? And part of the work I'm doing right now in my life and my deep, deep therapy work is to reconnect with my body that I disconnected with at a very young age for safety and reestablish a friendship, a loving relationship with my body because the body keeps the score, right? The body is where our trauma and our pain is and the tears, they're coming out of our body. But but I got to be able to get in there. I got to be able to feel so how do I both control my emotions and allow myself to feel? Hmm. Very good question. Um, training in martial arts helped me really understand that the best. Uh, it's the same we would say in training, emotions are great servants but poor masters. Again, emotions are great servants and poor masters. So what I mean by that is right now if I'm tired during this conversation, if I let the emotion of tired master me, I will fall asleep right now, or I won't be alert, or I won't uh, really be engaged in this conversation. Mm -hmm. The best time for me to be tired is when I'm at home about to go to sleep or in in my car, and I have the freedom to take a 15-minute power nap. So it's imperative that we learn how to release what's in us, but also how to control the emotions so that we're not releasing at the wrong time, like Liz is saying. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by ruling your emotions, but also releasing them. So again, we know uh, suppression is bad, but releasing them at the wrong time or releasing them the wrong way is bad as well. Mm. So regardless, if I'm angry, um, 
I'm not going to tell you story after story in my life, man. No, uh, we, wanna, we, we want stories. We want stories. Okay. Okay. So, I, I tell, okay. I tell, <laughs> tell you this one tell situation us all right now. Come on. All right. Let me, t- let me tell you this one. And this it, it'll show you how I had to uh, control or rule my emotions and release them. Uh, this building we're in right now, our nonprofit purchase to expand uh, programming for the Cave of Adullam because we got like almost 500 boys in the waiting list. Wow. Um, mm. One day I went to leave with my son. And I was, wasn't was paying attention to my surroundings. And I hear a voice say, yo, someone's trying to kill me. So I look to my left, and it's a guy on the cell phone, and I'm with my son. So I quickly draw my gun because I didn't know what was going on. Mm. And I said, who's trying to kill you? He said, they're coming around the corner now. It's a suburban coming around. Three guys are in it. I have my son on my left, and this guy I'm keeping my eye on to my right. In this moment, I become very angry because I'm upset at the fact that he brought this vehicle towards me and my son is next to me. So if I would have just in that moment released what I was feeling, I would have shot him and him. Mm-hmm. But that would have been that would have put me in prison to death. So I had to rule that emotion in the moment and get my son back in this building to safety. The issue was we had just purchased the building, so we hadn't changed the locks. So for me to get the key in, I had to fidget with it just enough to get it to come out about an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch to turn the key. All while I'm keeping my eye on this guy on the phone and this suburban coming around with three guys in it. I don't know if they have a gun or not. I get my son inside. So here's another opportunity. Now I have to rule the emotion of fear and sadness. I'm looking at my son's eyes through this little glass window. And I say, son, run to the back of the building everything is going to be okay. Inside of me, I wanted to cry. I wanted to shed tears because I didn't know if I was going to see my son anymore. Mm. But in that moment, like Liz said, that would have been detrimental to my son Mm. because he wasn't used to being in a traumatic environment like we were in at that moment. So he needed to see the lion in me. So I did subdue sadness in that moment so that my son can get to safety. I said, son, run to the back of the building. Everything's going to be all right. So when he left me, I'm hurting inside, but I had to shift back to vigilance. So I turn around, get in the weaver stance, use my truck as a barrier, because here there's cars turning around. The car then does another U-turn and go the opposite direction. And then I see the guy on the phone runs in the direction of the car. And I yell, so you're going to run in the same direction as the, the suburban, as the truck? And he says, yeah, I'll be all right now. And he just ran. Once I had a moment to think things through, they were trying to set me up because I had a brand new Yukon at the time and I was new in the area and it was it was a potential carjack. But when I drew my weapon, that changed the whole scenario. Wow. I went in and got my son, hugged him. We went home. So here we go, Justin, now to release him. I get home, sit in the living room. <clears throat> and uh, my, my wife says, <clears throat> she says to me, you know, you don't seem to be too okay. I says, I'm not. I said, I just went through a lot and I need a moment to release. Mm. And so my, I have a concept I created in Battle Cry where you reflect, release, reset so you can rest. They call it the four R's. And so it's imperative. Of course, you want to release. But if I were to, if my emotions would have mastered me in that moment, I could have, I'm a great shot. I could have killed all four of the guys, but I I wouldn't be on this interview right now. Mm. I could have cried in front of my son. He would have said, no, dad, I can't leave you. Now he's over emotional. He come out trying to protect dad and the guys, what if they would have started shooting? So we have Mm. to learn as men to be very responsible because it's something we have to speak on. Once we start freeing these men, we have to teach them the responsibility of now being able to express yourself freely because it comes with a great responsibility. And so I hope the listeners can understand how imperative it is. It's just as important to control or master your emotions in a moment as it is to release them. Mm. Yeah, that's a a very important technical, I I think, explanation that, that, that we need to talk about. And 
you know, so much of your work is building relationships with men and boys, right? And that mentorship, you know, I know you're involved with My Brother's Keeper. Um, obviously, all the work that you do is, is really building mentorship. And what we find in the data that I find so disheartening is that, you know, mentorship has an invaluable uh, impact on young boys, particularly black boys, right? So we know the the gap between bl being a black boy and being a white boy in America is extremely mm -hmm. wide. Uh, but that the number one thing that actually protects uh, a black boy the most um, in terms of, of ending up incarcerated or ending up in poverty or all of the different things that our society does to black boys is living in a city or an environment where black men are in the home. They don't even need a black man in their home. So it's not even about having a father inside their own father, but that men are around. And so for the book, I actually, my own book, I, I interviewed uh, someone who was part of my brother's keeper, my friend Mo, and he talks about growing up in the Bronx, growing up with a single mom, right? A dad with a father wound, just like the one that um, you speak of and so many men speak of. And there being this one guy, right? This one guy in his neighborhood who basically became his mentor, right? Mm -hmm. And... Again, what's disheartening is that women actually tend to mentor m more. Like it's more part of our, I think, our culture. And I think that there's something that's message to women that like help other girls and help them, you know, protect them, right, from the patriarchal society that they're going to be raised in. And I wonder how can we make that message just as powerful for men and boys, that men need to also protect boys um, from the same kind of obstacles that they may face so that we do see more men uh, becoming mentors for, mm. for young boys. Well, I mean, I see the messages. Maybe, I don't know if I'm like in a certain influence of people or sphere of people, but I see it all over the nation where black mm. men are stepping up in major ways. That's right. You know, even men who have their own children mm. are volunteering to be mentors in certain, in certain programs throughout this entire country. So I, I like there is not in in and 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 Jamie help me if I'm wrong. I've never seen at any time in my lifetime there's been as many mentoring programs as it, as it is in the black community. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's tons of men. I mean, just in Detroit alone, mm -hmm. I can, I can name you about fifty. Yeah, that are really doing great work in helping, and so I don't I don't see it as a problem. I guess the biggest issue is for making sh for our boys or sons who are in need of mentoring mm -hmm. to take advantage of these great programs mm -hmm. that are in every city, uh, well, in many of the cities across this country. And so, especially considering, you know, uh, how the prison industrial complex mm -hmm. seems to target boys of color, as you mentioned, alluded mm -hmm. to, uh, especially as far as the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's imperative that our sons, of course, have a, a male in their life, like I tell Many fathers who are, you know, in conflict with the mother of their child. Mm. I say, look, he doesn't necessarily need you in his home, but he needs you in his life. Right. And that's what's imperative. It's like, would you do whatever it takes to stay in his life? And I haven't met a father, and I've I've been doing this a long time. When you look at the stat or the the, the narrative being painted of black men are deadbeat dads and don't care, mm. that's a lie, man. Like their desire is to be with their son. But like you said earlier, Justin, they don't even feel that they're worthy enough because mm. say if one of them just got out of prison, he doesn't have a job. Or a man who's very successful as a lawyer feels bad because he can't even, he works 16 hours a day and he falls asleep at the table when he's with his son. And so all it's so many dynamics to why a man isn't there. But what I've learned is not that he doesn't want to be there. Mm. And so when you ask about the, the mentoring programs, you guys can come to Detroit. I will. It'll blow your mind. And and to be clear, I, you know, the mass incarceration uh, of mm. black men, black and brown men in America is the number one reason men can't father. Right. Like it's mm. it's we're actually breaking up families and we're preventing uh, men from being able to be fathers. So this is not. Yeah. To say like this is, uh, uh, you know, a, a problem of the black community. I think we've Agreed. created that problem mm. as a society. And black mm. men actually spend more time with uh, their kids than than. Yes. Uh, right. So we we do have data to, to mm -hmm. defeat that stereotype, which isn't true. That's why this this. Oh, yeah. You, that's a, you 
studying, Liz. Yeah, oh, no, this, sorry, this, I, this I, woman here. Right? Oh, no, oh, you spent yeah. some time oh, yeah, with her. No, yeah. She uh, <laughs> drops knowledge yeah. all the time. Um, the majority of black men are not incarcerated. Mm-hmm. The majority of black men mm-hmm. are, in fact, with their children. Um, the majority of black men are people that you want to be best friends with. But because there is such... Um, obviously systematic racism in our country and there's so much that is happening to the black community. This conversation is very important, but also at the same time, I don't want to perpetuate to the people that see you as they see you and see me that this is the narrative that keeps being, that they are um, used to hearing all the time. I also enjoy, which is why I'm reluctant sometimes uh, when uh, we have a black um person that we're talking to or when I show up somewhere, I don't want it to be about a black issue because, you know, there are black men and fathers Mm -hmm. that are just black fathers. So where I get conflicted is this is so important, the work you're doing, because we need it. And yet I also want to be sure that the rest of the world doesn't only continue to repeat the same narrative that black men need help, that we are. um, All men need help. Mm -hmm. Um, Just black men are singled out more than the rest. So I just have to say that out loud for anyone who is listening um, that uh, we are not Mm -hmm. that. Mm, We're monolithic, yeah. And we, Jason, what I like about what you're saying also is in many ways you just said we are suffering from the same thing Mm -hmm. that um, that we're perpetuating. What I want to get back to, and I think this is really important because your last book was about it's about crying like a man. Um, mm. I, I just think that there's so much in, there's so much in vulnerability and tears. And because of the work that I'm doing in my personal life, because I'm trying to reestablish that relationship with my body, because I'm trying to reteach myself how to allow myself to cry those tears that have the stress hormones in them. One of the things I noticed about your work and when you work with men and boys is that the way in is through their bodies. And so when I see you work with these boys, when I see you, when I see you work with your son and when, and and when you're, you're pushing them and you're saying, all right, get back up, let's go, let's go, let's go. And you're pushing them and they're trying and they're falling down and they're trying to get back up and they're frustrated. And then you ask them how they're feeling. Mm. Um, When you got the dad, when you brought the dad over and you told him to get down and do push-ups with the son on his back. Um, and for anybody who's listening to this, go go to his Instagram, watch his YouTube videos. You can see what Jason does um, in his cave. You're putting boys and men in physical situations that are challenging them or pushing them. And then you're asking them in those moments to emote or to to, to describe what they're feeling, which are not things mm-hmm. that we are asked. Okay. And oftentimes when we are asked questions, we deflect. Fine. We're good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. But that little <laughs> video, but the video of the yeah. boy, I'm nervous, sir. I started just bawling when I saw that. Yeah. Because yeah. we're not asked questions yeah. as men. As men, we're not we're not we're not asked questions and we're taught to not ask questions. If you're using a physical situation and testing a man while asking him an emotional, vulnerable question. And it's the combination of the two that lets the armor down. That's what I've viewed. Now, I got I, okay, for that. okay. When I'm able to break the physical body, when I'm able to take a boy or a man to its limits, because as men we think all we need to be is strong. Yep. As soon as this body has reached its limit, what there. do you draw upon? There you that's go. It. That's, that's it. Cracks so it now, open. yeah, and now you're like, whoa, what, what is this that I'm feeling? Because I can't hide behind the masculine facade anymore. Mm-hmm. And so now they're the place I say, what? Why? Why are you shaking the way you are? What are you feeling? And you would think it's because either the drill we're doing is making them exhausted or. Uh, the guy has taken their back and is about to choke them and I tell him to stop, what are you feeling? Instead of saying, I'm going to lose this match, this reminds me of a time Mm. when I felt the pressure of failing a spelling bee or the time when my father cursed me out because I made uh, too many mistakes in one day. Mm -hmm. So that allows me, so I use the physical and the, the martial arts is nothing like it that makes or takes us there. Because again, we can fake it shooting the ball, running, you know, getting tackled or whatever. But when a punch is coming at your face, a kick is coming, so you're grappling, someone literally is in your space. 
your emotions, how you feel, not necessarily about the, the, the situation, but what do you feel about yourself? A lot of things will come up. Those voices of you're not good enough, you're a mm. loser. You start hearing your father. You start remembering when your mother wasn't there. And that's the moment on the mat when you'll see a recruit just break down yeah. and we'll say, what's going on? Or like, uh, so it's an excellent question, Just I was training with my son, getting him ready for his, his school year. I had him spar with my assistant. And I wanted him to feel the pressure. And I, and I wanted him to feel what it felt like not to be able to get a punch in. Mm. What does it feel like when you're in life when you can't do nothing with what's in front of you? Like with my mother, when she had dementia, I tried lion's mane, all these other vitamins and supplements to help get mom's memory back. Nothing worked. Mm. What do you do then? So Jason, as he was sparring with Chris, he couldn't get anything in. And Chris was not trying to hurt him, but I wanted him to touch him and make him frustrate. Jason just stops and starts crying. I said, what's wrong, son? He says, dad, it's the voices. I said, what, what do you mean? Man, Jason, you're looking bad. Because, again, no one wants to look nasty. That's the biggest, as men, it's our egos in a way. Mm. Then he says, you're not good enough. Your dad is here looking at you, and you can't even get one punch in. And then that opens the door for me to tell him how much I'm already proud of him. Mm. That it wouldn't matter if he didn't get a punch in the entire sparring session. He's still my favorite. Mm. Those things. So then we go to affirmation. Then he gets confidence. I say, all right, son, I need you now to spar with Chris from who you long to be. Mm. Not where you think you are, but from who you long to be. Then mm. a different person arises. So yeah. it's not really a, a system to what I do yeah. because, again, everyone is different. And I don't teach off of a template model. You know, I allow them to show me what they need. Mm -hmm. And even we can have 20, 20 recruits on the mat at one time. And one recruit to have an issue the entire class I follow the most high spirit and we'll shift the entire training around him and what he's dealing with in that moment. And everyone there will benefit, even the fathers who are watching. Mm -hmm. So excellent question. I, I see what you're saying. And can I, can I say something real quick? Yeah, please. It's on please. my heart to say, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a lot of times as we, you know, we're in these circles dealing with manhood, especially in the black community, you know, we, we, we know statistically what's going on uh, as far as it relates to, uh, what the black man and black boys are experiencing. But I want to be very careful that we don't forget, you know, brothers of other ethnicity mm -hmm. and white men as well. Mm -hmm. When I look at my direct messages, I can scroll for a while. Yeah. And it's nothing but white men faces. Wow. Okay. And I see them and I'm often, I'm always reminded, Jason, and, and that's guy, he says, look, it's not just what black people are dealing with, black men, rather. Yes, the system is slighted against. We, statistically, no one can argue that. That's right. But we're talking about what's going on with us psychologically. Why men can't feel. This is a universal issue. And so I just want to make it very clear so that no one listening feels like they're being neglected mm -hmm. or dismissed. Mm -hmm. and I just, I just really, It's very important because I see the messages I see the messages, and just That's because right. I have friends who are bankers, man, and he says, Jay, why do you think a banker, you know, lose a job, go home and kill everybody? But you lose your job, you just find another one. There's a different pressure, it's a different lifestyle. Just as my white friend may not understand what I go through as a black man, I don't understand what he has to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so, but when you have an entire culture that's stuck in fight or flight response, no one will ever understand each other. Everyone is in defense. Everyone's fighting. Even love will look like conflict. And so it just was heavy on my heart to make sure that no man is left behind. Yeah. Period. And it, it's, it's so important. I love that. I appreciate you sharing that. That is a, a big belief of mine, all of ours. Yeah. Um, and I'm really happy that you shared it. Um, if you don't mind, I, I want to read something real quick. It is a quote from the Baha'i writings from the central figure named Abdul Baha one of the central figures, it says, the more difficulties one sees in the world, the more perfect one becomes. The more you plow and dig the ground, the more fertile it becomes. The more you cut the branches of a tree, the higher and stronger it grows. The more you put the gold in the fire, the purer it becomes. 
The more you sharpen the steel by grinding, the better it cuts. Therefore, the more sorrows one sees, the more perfect one becomes. That is why in all times, the prophets of God have had tribulations and difficulties to withstand. The more often the captain of a ship is in the tempest and difficult sailing, the greater his knowledge becomes. Therefore, I am happy that you have had great tribulations and difficulties. For this, I am very happy that you have had many sorrows. Strange it is that I love you, and still I am happy that you have had sorrows. I love this because it reminds me that in those times that when we are uh, grieving, when we are having trouble, that we can use those as strength. That's when we learn, when we are broken down. This is what I love about when you were saying about you break the body down so that what do you do in that state now? I mean, man, I, w- I would, you know, I would actually hang that up in our academy because as soon as they step foot on the mat, they're tested. Faith is all theory until we've been tested. And so is love. And so we put our boys through it to make sure that they not only are able to rule and release their emotions, but when they're faced with it in reality. Liz even said one of my quotes, you know, a lot of men want to be hard, but they don't want to do anything that's hard. We have a, a teaching we call let go of the blow. I talk about it as well in the battle cry. Because one thing is, man, we don't do when something hits us. Mm. We stay with the fact that we've been hit and we're still dwelling on the fact Mm. that we've been hit. And now a plethora of punches are coming our way and now we're gone. Hmm. So when we teach, when you get hit, you got to let go of that blow immediately. That it can't it does you no good to be emotional in this moment when other punches are coming. Hmm. When you're, you're, you're trying to be faithful and women are flirting at you. You can't let that go to your head. You got to immediately let go of the blow and keep going and keep moving forward. And that's why it's imperative that they learn how to rule and release. And so adversity is a great teacher in that. I love the way the warrior David said, everyone knows who David is as far as fighting Goliath in the Bible. He says, before I was afflicted, uh, he's talking to God. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Mm. It's something that happens to us when we go through adversity that makes us stronger. It makes us give up what's causing us to give up. And that's what it's meant. We have to learn how to embrace that. And again, I have to, again, go back to what my sister Liz said. There's a big difference between venting and complaining. Okay? Complaining does us no good. It does our wives, our children no good. Venting is a completely different story. Mm -hmm. And you can know the difference because one is rooted in you being a slave to your emotions Mm -hmm. and the other is rooted in you just trying to express them. Mm -hmm. You literally just quoted Abdul Baha. Indeed. Be not a be not a slave to your Mm -hmm. emotions, but their master. Uh, we could talk to you for hours. Oh man, and hours and hours. <laughs> I did want to ask hours. one question though before we moved on. I'm sorry. You talk about uh, a shame you felt or embarrassment about sexuality, being a virgin, um, that whole thing that you have shared about. And I think Liz, you might. Yeah, just the the ideal, right? That we expect men to be very promiscuous and always be mm. up for it. And sex is such a huge part of ideals of masculinity. Justin talks about this too. So, well, you know. Um, it, <sighs> I didn't want to lose my virginity. It was, I actually was peer pressured into doing so. Um, it was a girl who had money. Um, she was attractive, but I, I didn't really like her like that. And But because my boys were upstairs and I was downstairs with her, I could not come back upstairs without having had sex with her. And after I had sex with her, man, it felt like something left me. Um the first thing that changed in me um, was my attitude towards women. I, even my mother, I, I lost respect. It was like, like I was supposed to just meet, mistreat women, that they were no longer what I, I thought this relationship thing was. Because the only thing that I got credit for was just having sex, not necessarily caring for this woman. And to see in our community, you know, I like the word lothario, which basically is a man who behaves selfishly just to take advantage of women in like sexual relationships. And that's what what is promoted, not just in the black community, but just throughout Mm -hmm. manhood is that, you know, you're only as good as your last hit. You know, I mean, what 
you know, what we, we demean when we call them what trophy wives and things like that. And I, it never really set well with me to be sleeping around with a lot of women. Women I always wanted to have this one woman, but because of my culture, being a popular DJ at the time and girls throwing themselves at you, um, I mean, I just thought that was the way to be. But I was very unhealthy, you know, put myself at risk for STDs. And um, it affected me going into marriage as well, man, because I think the most beautiful thing is when a man can keep his virginity until he's married and experience sex and his wife keep her virginity as well and experience sex for the first time with her. And everything is brand new from that day on. Me and my wife often talk about that. Um, and, you know, ironically, um, I remember one time I talked about a cry like a man when one of my cousins found out that I was a virgin. And I think I was maybe, I can't remember how old I was at the time. And they dogged me, man, in front of the whole family, laughed at me. My mother laughed, everyone. And that's when I went back to Detroit on mission to lose, on a mission to lose my virginity. My cousin, that happened in 84, I believe. He called me maybe three years ago to apologize for that because he had read my book and he said, Jason, I just want to apologize mm. for throwing you off the path that you wanted to be on. And that moved me because I looked up to Kev. He was just the smoothest guy, tall, athletic, everything. But for him to call me, even at my, you know, three years ago to say he's sorry for that, it just confirmed that, man, the message is, is getting out there that, you know, what I search for in sex, it was this effectless attempt to get what I longed for, mm -hmm. which was affirmation from a woman that mm -hmm. I loved. Wow. And then once I Action. got that in my wife, sex became much more than physical. I'm, I'm really happy you brought that up, Jason. I'm really happy you brought that up, brother, because... I love hearing men like you champion uh, chastity. It's a very rare thing, actually, to hear, um, and and it's it's really refreshing. I I also wanted to stay a virgin, and my situation was a little bit different in that 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 first time for me it was taken from me without my consent, and mm. I'm currently unpacking a lot of that right now. I write about it a little bit in the book and I'm unpacking a lot of that right now and recognizing that it was a bigger experience than I allowed it to be for myself because as a man, my worth has been defined by how sexual I am with other men. Because what do we talk about when we're with other boys and men when we're 17, mm -hmm. 18, 19, 20? We talk about who we're hooking up with, right? And oftentimes as Tony mm -hmm. Porter says and From a Call to Men, he talks about the language that we use right? It's actually violent. You know, did you smash that? He says, and we think about, and, and then, you know, so how the hell, how the hell are, am I right? Going to go to a, a boy, another guy and, and be like, Oh man, I just lost my virginity, but it was actually kind of traumatic for me. They'd laugh. They'd laugh. Mm -hmm. That's what yes. we do to other boys. Yes. We're, so you're not even allowed to be in a situation where you're spiritual and you want to, you want to save that for somebody. I think, Oftentimes in our culture, it can be looked at as like uh, old fashioned and repressive, but I don't think that's at all what you're getting at and at all what I'm feeling. And I think that it's important mm -hmm. that we allow people to expre express the fullness of their spirituality and their sexuality and not shame them for it, mm -hmm. especially young boys, because mm -hmm. I believe that mm -hmm. boys are sensitive. We are so damn sensitive. We just taught ourselves to not be so that we can avoid being bullied and, and made fun of and policed. And that means that we're sensitive when it comes to sexuality because we desire and long for connection. And, uh, and we've had to numb that out so much. So I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing that story for, for all of us. I, I resonate with it deeply. Um, Thank you for sharing your story, man. Uh, that's uh, really deep that you held on to that for so long. And, you know, Hopefully some men right now will go unpack that because again, you know, with what they would say, man, you're lucky, you know, how, how does she look? You know, instead of saying, yo, this still was something I didn't want to do. Yeah. I commend yeah. you for that. Thank you. Well, we gotta, we gotta stop with the boys will be boys. That's why, you know, I'm writing the, I'm writing the middle grade book of man enough right now and we're calling it boys will be human. 
mm. with boys crossed out. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, mm, that's what that's this is good. about is we, we got to stop. We got to stop. Mm-hmm. We are suffering and we're hurting. Mm-hmm. Hurt people, hurt people. So uh, mm-hmm. can we get into a bunch of questions? We got some rapid fire questions for you. Rapid fire, rapid fire rapid. questions, rapid fire rapid. answers. Just yes. like boom, 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 boom. Do I have to you respond? Worked. Do I have to respond rapidly? Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast rapid fire questions. First, uh, Liz, do we have an audience question? We do. We have one from Eileen Guest. Um, and the question is, in your mind, when does a boy become a man? That's hard to say. Um, for me, the sign is when he can take care of himself. Mm. Like yeah. when a boy can actually take care of himself holistically in every area of his life, mm. from finances to mentally to if he has enough money to take care of a family as well. Mm. So to me, that's a sign of a boy becoming a man, when he puts away childish things, things that he used to do that only the adolescents would do, and start living responsibly, and then more so to me, comprehensively. Mm-hmm. Jason, when was the last time you cried? Uh, yesterday. What happened yesterday? Again, thinking thinking about my son yesterday, mm-hmm. just wanting to be the best dad that I could be, and and then, then also coupled with that, just feeling the pressure of so many people depending on you and just wanting to be alone, you know? And yeah, and that's what I get that. It just it, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's what drew the tears. All right, let's let's do real fast. Boom, boom, boom. We're gonna just ask you like <laughs> we're gonna throw six at you and just like quick. Something that you learned from another man. Um, be what I didn't see. When was the last time you apologized? Um last week to my wife for um, being short with her. Um, I, I felt convicted and I needed to apologize so that we can mm-hmm. reconcile and move on. Mm-hmm. You got a time travel device and you get a chance to go back to eight, nine, ten year old Jason. Mm-hmm. What do you want to tell him? You're good enough. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Mm. That's and what I would is, tell them. Yeah, why does that make you cry? <laughs> I mean, several reasons. Um, I see so many good men. Who are constantly trying to hit a target that's unattainable because of the pressure of the society. And uh, it's a never ending battle just to try to be good enough. That hurts. And then uh, me thinking of just 10 year old Jason just trying to find his way um, by myself pretty much the majority of the time. Uh, having to learn how to fight, having to learn how to do everything on, your, on my own. And and it just hurts because I, I love working with boys. And when I, I see myself, just that I'm good enough, you know, it's, 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 it's tough. Even now, you know, I, I, that's why I let men know that say, you know, good things to me, like um, Brother Jamie did, you know, to encourage me. That's why it's so important that I be vulnerable, because if they think that I've just mastered it and I've, I've got it together and it's not a war that I wage every day, they'll constantly be discouraged. But I, uh, I constantly fight. I tell myself every day to keep going, you know. Uh, God wouldn't put on you more than you can bear. You got to keep going, keep going. You can do it. And that's why I cry, because so many of us live from the feelings of what we're not instead of who we really are. Mm. Yeah, I got me. My man. You got a time, you got a time travel device now. You get to go to your funeral. You're watching your funeral. Mm. What do you hope mm-hmm. they say about you? but the way you move through the world as a man and as a father? Uh, I don't want to sound mean, 
Um, but I wouldn't care at that point. I would. It's uh, <laughs> my favorite answer. I would be. I would be at home and with my father in heaven. And uh, oh, you got there's me no too. better place. No better place. No better place than to be in the very essence of peace. So they can say what they want. Yeah. It doesn't matter at that point. Mm. Man, you you are uh <laughs> you are a sweet soul, brother. You are demonstrating uh to me what it does mean to be a man. Uh you are strong and you have conviction and you are emotional and you're in touch with your feminine qualities as well as your masculine. Um you are standing up for something greater than yourself, man. Can I interject real quick? Please. Can I interject, please, good brother? Yes, sir. Um, there are no feminine and masculine emotions like that. God didn't create some emotions for men and some for women. Agreed. Because if that's the case, we, yeah, so it's just we're being oh, I, human. Well, yeah, what yeah, I mean, no, when, saying, I, when I say that, I don't, I, don't, I don't attribute masculinity to men or femininity to women. So I say those yeah, oh, no, qualities. I get it, I get it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I was just saying in general, because I love Justin, how it just approaches just basically for us just to be free. I knew how you meant it. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I want people to know because we we, we continue. And, and if you know it with human nature, we're constantly building boxes around us. These mm -hmm. classifications. I'm out the box. I'm mm -hmm. anything and everything that I have to be at any given moment. You can't lock me into anything. Mm -hmm. God created me to feel the freedom to feel. It's just to be free, and, and that's yeah. what I, I desire and I fight for, and, and that's what I, I hope for all three of you because you guys are really doing a great work and helping so many people that are listening. Mm. And when you are, when you can tell people there is no box, mm -hmm. live from the good in our hearts instead of our fears, and, and, that and that's all. I just I just wanted to say. And this yes, goes sir. this goes right into our last question, which is what does it mean? to be man enough? Hmm. That's a deep, short question. Um, to be man enough means to me is to be content with who you are in every moment, to not condemn yourself in the areas of your life that you need to improve. I'm in a stage of you evolving every time as I, I take a next, another step, another breath. The pressure that I feel is what I put on myself. But your question prompts me to, 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 to understand, well, realize that I have what I need. Mm -hmm. I just have to be willing to allow myself to uh, be transformed and renew my mind. Well, Jason, let me just tell you, my friend, that not only are you man enough, but you are good enough. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you for being here with us. Thank you so this much. This was one of my favorite conversations. Yeah. yeah. Remarkable yeah. work. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you so much. Well, we'll be right back. This is Men. Hello, and welcome back to the Man Enough Podcast. I'm mm. Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. And uh, I, we, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I just had a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Indeed you did. You had an emotional experience as well. I think we, yeah. I mean, I think we all did. When, when he started to cry about his nine-year-old self, and um, you, I saw you no, cry, I, and I, then I was like, just lost there it. wasn't a, yeah, a dry in um, the house. That is such a... Um, I won't go into it, but when you ask that question and when he cries and I think about what I would say to myself and seeing him break down, oh man, that got me. The whole thing, you know, there's so many similarities um, and things I related to. Um, mm. And he talked about his mom and I, you know, it got me again because of my own relationship with my mom and he sh he expressed how he showed up for his mom. Mm. And I haven't shown up for my mom in a long time. Mm. Um, I mean, 
<clears throat> you know, I show up for her financially, I help her and she's in my life and stuff, but I have such trauma with because of the experience with bipolar and her mental health and, you know, the weight I had to carry yeah. um, as a young man um, and boy and what I still carry in resentment and all that stuff. So hearing how he shows up for his mom made me feel um, not enough. Mm. And the truth is, we're not always enough, you know? Um, so when we are saying you are enough, it's like, yes, you're enough as a man. That doesn't mean you're always doing enough. Or that you can be everything and do everything, yeah. right? So, yeah, so um, it was yeah. a good thing for me to hear. It's like, oh, I can be better at that. Mm. So mm. you're going to call your mom? Yeah. Should you call her right now? Can't call her now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dang. Oh. Um, what, how did you feel, Liz? I, I, I mean, I loved hearing Jason and I loved seeing Jason's effect on the both of you. I think that I certainly had an emotional reaction, but it wasn't nearly as powerful as the one that I could see uh, that you were experiencing because I think that there's trauma and there's pain uh, that is truly like unites you as men, mm -hmm. as growing up as men in our society. Yeah. Mm. And I could see so much of it being released. Mm in you and and so i thought i i just felt really lucky to get to witness it and but also notice the difference you Makes know he, he, yeah and oh, well he talks about emotional incarceration yeah that's what mm -hmm. it is and it's a this prison. is what i was seeing I was seeing both of you kind of break free mm -hmm. uh, through this yeah. conversation in the bahai faith abdul baha talks about the prison of self mm -hmm. and i think so often we as men can we lock ourselves in these prisons, yeah. you know, mm. but as you were talking, I couldn't help but think it's almost like the field of dreams phenomena, mm. which is women don't cry at the end of field of dreams. <laughs> Men do. <laughs> right. And if you're too young to know what field of dreams is, which, uh, you know, it's a movie that ask your, ask, if you have a dad, ask your dad about it. I bet he mm. cried. In it. But, um, it's interesting. I, I noticed that there's a lot of times that my wife will be not affected emotion as emotionally as I am by something. Yeah. And I think it is unique to the male struggle. Yes. And in similar ways, she will cry yes. at the drop of a hat hearing a woman. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there's a chance sometimes I can't relate to that yeah. struggle. Yeah. But he was just, you know what? I think it, it goes back to what I said earlier. When, when men meet safe men, who intuitively we know can hold our emotions and our feelings, there is a freedom there that where we are allowed to feel safe and vulnerable and comfortable. Mm. And I and I don't even know if it's conscious. I think that my body felt safe mm. in that moment. And yeah. as he was talking and I'm like tearing up, I'm like, there wasn't even the part of me that's like, suck it back in, suck it back in, damn it, Justin, mm. be a man. That didn't exist mm. with him. Wow. Because that exists in a lot of other areas and with a lot of other people and with women. Right? Of course. So I, I just thought it was a fantastic conversation. And I love your mm -hmm. question because in my personal work outside of this podcast, I, you know, I do talk a lot about the, the need for us men to not make our wives or our girlfriends or therapists. And I think that your question to him mm -hmm. and his answer was profound mm -hmm. in that understanding the timing, mm -hmm. when and where. Yeah. And how yes. emotion should be expressed. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was I thought that was brilliant. Yes. And again, it's just by communicating, mm -hmm. you know, and asking, can you yeah. do you have space for this right now? <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, That's what Emily said on the podcast. It just yes. all comes back to communication yes. and just talking. Yes. You know, one thing I loved about him, I've asked someone, um, people before, name me uh ten great white men. Yeah. Um, they'll name people and they will name some um, politicians, they will name some rich, you know, moguls, they will name some athletes, they will name some singers, but they, but most of the time it's not. Now name 10 black men and it's always an athlete or athletes, a singer. Yeah. Yeah. Or, it's never someone who speaks like that, but there are many of them. Yeah, There are many amazing people. So what I love about <clears throat> what he's doing and the platform that he's speaking on is that uh, other people get to see him and reframe their thought of what they think a black man only mm. is. He also, this is coming up for me. I was really lucky to have a friend and a mentor um, and a, a mutual friend of ours, Marvin Brock. Mm, he does remind me of Marvin too. Who, um, who, here we go. Who passed away of cancer. 
but Marvin was a Tai Chi was a was a was a martial arts master. Mm -hmm. He was a black belt, um, and was kind of my first mentor and was really helping me in that phase when Emily and I were in that uh, just that our polarization was off and I was pushing and she was like, what are you doing? And, and, um, and he, as a martial artist was the first person to tell me what Jason said today, which is, um, basically to not, uh, not to, not to be a slave to our emotions. Mm. And he taught me how to meditate and he, I write about him in the book and how he taught me to be flexible and he, the difference between the oak tree and the palm tree and how as men were taught to be rigid oak trees, you know, we have to be strong and impermeable and tough. And we often don't want to be palm trees, mm. the, the flimsy, bendy palm trees. Mm. But at the end of a hurricane, what's standing? Yeah. Not the rigid oak tree, the palm tree that's able to bend and to flow, right? Like Bruce Lee says, to be like water. And I just, he reminded me a lot. So mm. I'm sending tons of love up to Marvin, to Marvin, wherever you are, brother. Liz, can I ask you a question? Yes. You had said uh, at the beginning of our recap here, uh, of course, you were moved and felt so much, but you also really were um, intrigued or moved by mm -hmm. our connection. As mm -hmm. um, and you are a, um, I don't know if this is the right term or not, forgive me, but you are a feminist. Um, <laughs> That's the right term to describe. <laughs> That's pretty, yeah. term. Uh, pretty overt about that. <laughs> pretty overt. <laughs> not a secret. Um, <laughs> My question is, so, and, and, and the reason why you are, it's for all of humanity, women yeah. and men both, and yeah. all, um, all walks, mm -hmm. identifying it, however we may identify. My question is, why do you care when you see this and what you had described between the three of us and what you witnessed? Why does that matter to you? What do you get from that? How does that make you feel in that regard? Well, how can I not care? I mean, is, is, is sort of my response, right? Of, of, I mean, we're all humans and just because we have a different gender, like, right, or identify in a different, like, to me, there's, there is no separation in that way of like your pain is completely, completely tied to my pain. And there, there, there there's just no, um, there's, it's distinct in the way that I don't get emotional at the same time things that you do because mm. I have I have I haven't been raised at the same kind of like the patriarchy has affected us in completely different ways <laughs> right mm -hmm. like the pressures that are on you are fundamentally different from the pressures that are put on me but I've been hurt by the same you know sword or whatever you want to call it mm. and so it's meaningful to to me and and it's helpful for me to understand what that pain is so that then you can, you know, in the same way that it's, it's, it's helpful when you under, you understand my pain mm -hmm. and then we just understand each other better. Um, which is the key to all of it is compassion and indeed. empathy. It, exactly. And so I just, yeah, I, I feel really grateful that I got to, to bear witness to that and that I feel safe enough that, that you could feel everything that you were feeling around me. That's like, that's the best gift to me mm. <laughs> as a woman. We couldn't do it without you. Mm, indeed. That's right. We're so yes. happy that you're here. I felt your hearts. And we're so happy that you are here, mm -hmm. uh, dear listener. And if you like what you're hearing, please continue to listen and like and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can go to manenough.com slash podcast. And, uh, and we just really appreciate you being here and for staying in the room and taking the time and listening and uh, learning with us in real time. Indeed. So uh, we hope you uh, stick with us. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And uh, this is Man Enough. Man Enough.